uh, first three verses of Hosea chapter 2 sought to make something very clear about the, the words that came before it and, and those that were going to follow. It is that the goal and the outcome of God's harsh discipline of Israel, that was symbolized by Gomer, was restoration of relationship and revitalization of blessings not abolishment of the covenant that he made with them, the covenant of Moses, nor a divorce from them. It is with this underlying theme and purpose that we are to study and understand the book of Hosea. Now, I'm sorry to say that the bulk of biblical commentaries on this book ignores these opening verses and instead concludes that God was permanently through with Israel. And this opened the door for him to adopt a new covenant people, the Gentile church, to replace the one that he now rejected. And to adopt a new covenant, replacing the covenant of Moses. And I suppose I could end this thought right here, but the question must be rolling around in the minds of at least some of you. Why would Bible commentators hold such a view that seems so counter to what the Holy Scriptures tell us? And perhaps the answer is simpler than we might think. The notable Christian philosopher Douglas Gruthuth says this about the subject of biblical truth. He says, truth is a daunting, difficult thing, also the greatest thing in the world, and yet we are chronically ambivalent towards it. We seek it and we fear it. Our better side wants to pursue truth wherever it leads, but our darker side balks when the truth begins to lead us anywhere we do not want to go. Just as the doctrines and traditions of the strange sort of hybrid Hebrew Canaanite faith that King Jeroboam led the people of the northern kingdom of Israel to adopt were meant to pursue his agendas, his agenda and not God's truth, so was that as early as the fourth century, the Rome-based leadership of this new Gentile faith of Christianity made a fateful decision to create doctrines and traditions that led Gentiles to adopt their agenda instead of scriptural truth. And one of the foundational assumptions of these new Romanized Christian doctrines and traditions was that God abolished the covenant He had made with Israel, transferred the blessings that should have belonged to Israel to the newly created Gentiles only church. Virtually all doctrine that followed was based upon that bedrock principle. Now, what that means for us is that there's a lot of undoing to do. A lot of it. In order to return, to return us to a truth that most of our brothers and sisters in the faith do not want to hear. Because as Professor, Professor Groot, who comments, it takes us where most just don't want to go. This same dynamic of being taken where they do not want to go is why Hosea was shunned by the ten tribes of Israel, and it cost them dearly for millennia. Millennia. Shunning God's truth brings enormous consequences that may not be immediate, but they're certain to come, and they can have devastating effects for very long periods of time. Well, let's reread a portion of Hosea chapter 2. Open your Bibles to Hosea chapter 2. We're going to read verses 4 through 15. 
Hosea chapter 2, starting at verse 4. <clears throat> rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she isn't my wife and I'm not her husband. She must remove her whoring from her face and her adulteries from between her breasts. Otherwise, I will strip her naked and place her as she was the day she was born. Make her like a desert, place her like a dry land, and kill her with thirst. I will have no pity on her children, for they are children of whoring. Their mother prostituted herself. She who conceived them behaved shamelessly. She said, I'll pursue my lovers, who gave me my food and my water, wool, flax, olive oil, and wine. Therefore, I'll block her. Uh, I'll block her way with thorns and put up a hedge so she can't find her paths. She'll pursue her lovers but not catch them. She will seek them but won't find them. And then she'll say, I will go and return to my first husband because these things were better for me then than they are now. For she doesn't know it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil. I who increased her silver and gold which they used for Baal. So I'll take back my grain at harvest time and my wine in its season. I will snatch away woolen flax give, given to cover her naked body. Now, now I will uncover her shame while her lovers watch, and no one will save her from me. I will end her happiness, her festivals, Rosh Hodesh and Shabbats, all of her designated times. I'll ravage her vines and fig trees, of which she says, these are my wages that my lovers have given to me. I'll turn them into a forest, and wild animals will eat them. I will punish her for offering incense on the feast days of the Baals, when she decked herself with earrings and jewels, pursuing her lovers and forgetting me, says Adonai. Now, what we just read is symbolism that is spoken with in a literary context consisting of a mix of metaphor and allegory. Therefore, I prefer to think of it more as poem. Now, there's a reasonable scholar, scholarly debate over whether or not it is actually meant as a poem or just bears the earmarks of ancient Hebrew pottery, uh, pottery, poetry, without it necessarily being poetry. Nevertheless, the backdrop of this interesting poetic narrative is a court case. It's a judiciary setting. The accuser, the judge, the jury, these are God. God, who's portrayed as this aggrieved husband, Hosea. Now, the accused, the wife, is Israel, that is portrayed as the adulterous woman, Gomer. In verse 4, the children of Gomer are added to the mix with God, Hosea, declaring that his children, symbolic of the people of Israel, are to accuse Israel of adultery. And at this moment, the term Israel cannot mean much else but Israel's leadership, and we need to keep in mind that adultery is strictly a human-to-human -human offense. Adultery in relation to God is just a metaphorical expression, because there's no actual marriage between humans and God. And as concerns God, then, adultery towards Him is idolatry. So this entire scene is meant to represent a seriously bad circumstance between Jehovah and his people Israel. However, at this time, Israel only refers to the ten tribes of the northern kingdom of Israel and not to the two tribes of the southern kingdom that's called Judah. The statement that she isn't my wife and I'm not her husband is not a judgment. It's a statement that when adultery occurs, this estrangement 
between a husband and wife is the theoretical condition that it necessarily throws, thrusts both parties in two. Nowhere in the Old Testament do we ever hear of such a statement being made as some sort of a Hebraic word formula in a divorce proceeding. In fact, in this narrative, the hope of the husband is to reform and regain a wife that behaves as a wife should. Now this isn't my conjecture. It's clearly stated in verses 16 and 17 after the series of accusations and threats have concluded. We're going to just leap ahead there for, for, for just a moment. So take a look at verses 16 and 17. It says, But now I'm going to woo her. I'll bring her out to the desert, and I will speak to her heart, and I'll give her her vineyards from there, and the Echor Valley as a gateway to hope. She will respond there, as she did when she was young, as she did when she came up from Egypt. Now, I jumped ahead to make this point early in the process of studying this portion of Hosea. The rather standard idea that this is a divorce proceeding is as preposterous as the popular idea that Hosea was told to go find a prostitute and marry her. This would be breaking God's laws to the max. Prostitutes were, by God's command, unclean, off limits. The thought of a righteous Hebrew male marrying a prostitute was out of the question. The same concerns divorce. I mean, who can forget what we read in, in, in Malachi? about God's attitude regarding divorce. Malachi 2.16, I hate divorce, says Adonai, the God of Israel, and him who covers his clothing with violence, says Adonai Zevaot. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and don't break faith. However, should a divorce occur, a man was not to remarry his former wife. This would especially apply in the case of Hosea and in Gomer, were it actually a divorce proceeding, because God's involved. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, starting in verse 1, suppose a man marries a woman and consummates the marriage, but later finds her displeasing because he has found her offensive in some respect. He writes her a divorce document, gives it to her, and sends her away from his house. She leaves his house, goes and becomes another man's wife, but the second husband dislikes her. And he writes her again, gives it to her, sends her away from his house. Or the second husband whom she married dies. In such a case, her first husband who sent her away may not take her again as his wife. Because she's now defiled. It would be detestable to Adonai. And you're not to bring about sin in the land of Adonai your God that he's giving to you as your inheritance. So biblically speaking, a wife committing adultery has, theoretically, already married another man. And this is essentially the argument that God, as Hosea, is making by saying that the result of Gomer's harlotry is that she's not my wife and I'm not her husband. So if Hosea were to actually divorce Gomer, for her adultery, no remarriage, no resumption of relationship would be possible. This is the law of God. This is not some man-made tradition. It's the second half of verse 4 that explains what Gomer, this unfaithful wife, must do to remediate this untenable situation. It says she must remove her whoring from her face, her adulteries from between her breasts. Now, whatever exactly this means, Gomer must do it. It has to do with her outward appearance. See, this is nearly certainly referring to some combination of makeup, or maybe jewelry, or amulets. Now, some scholars 
think it is that there were women Baal worshippers that wore special jewelry to indicate their devotion. But in truth, nothing's ever been found to support that theory. So how she appears in public is, according to God, step number one towards being restored. Now, ladies, take heed. Okay? What this is speaking to is how much appearance indicates your identity and your morals. Now, throughout the Bible, modesty is put forth as a high virtue of the godly woman. Now, I'm not about to step on a landmine by saying exactly what modesty is to look like in today's cultures and societies. But I think we all know within our own society when we see pretty suggestive attire that crosses over some difficult to define boundary of feminine and flattering and do wholly inappropriate for a god fear as a believer your conscience that has been reformatted to the holy spirit to more conform to the will of the father he will tell you where that boundary is the issue is are you going to pay attention to it? Step five speaks of what happens. She refuses to take this first step. God says he'll strip her naked. By not taking that first step, Gomer would be admitting her guilt and her determination to remain on her ruinous path. Now let's revert back now to who Gomer represents, Israel at large. What are the outward appearances of Israel's adultery? They're whoring, if you would, before God. Worshipping Baal and all the visible trappings of idols. It's attending all those pagan festivals. It's setting aside the commandments of the law of Moses that necessarily goes with it. The phrase to be stripped naked or to be stripped like a whore is found in other ancient Near East covenants and peace treaties. That is, it refers to the breaker of the covenant in those rather nasty terms. Now, the idea is that to be stripped naked means to publicly shame the covenant breaker. And this sort of action is nearly unthinkable for a person of the ancient Near East Eastern societies. It's not that a person necessarily had all their clothes removed. It's like our expression of warning someone that we're going to skin them alive. Now, some very good commentators say that the term Israel has in this verse sort of momentarily morphed into meaning the land. And this is because the next threat is making Gomer like a desert wilderness and then killing her with thirst. This is some, an interpretation I really can't rule out, but I think it is less likely than this being an allegorical reference to the woman being barren and infertile, like a wilderness. And her dying of thirst, meaning longing for children she cannot produce. Now, this is one of these rather standard biblical curses on a prostitute or an adulterous woman. On the one hand, one could say, see it referring to the land of Israel being denuded of trees and vegetation and suffering drought. It's just the idea of a sudden switch mid sentence from Israel to being people to being the land that I'm skeptical about. Well, verse 6 sort of throws a curveball. When it says that these same children that were told to accuse their mother of whoring are now condemned as the children of whoredom, and thus God will show them no pity. Now, here's such an important truth to take from this. 
because the children are referring to the people of Israel, and because they are accusing their mother of being adulterous, they are essentially doing the same thing. So they're condemning themselves. While the mother is leading the way, nonetheless, God holds the children responsible for their own choices and their own actions. Now, I regularly point to the pulpit and say that God holds above all the leaders of our faith responsible for how we lead and teach you. We are held to a higher standard because the Lord put us in a position of leadership and leadership affects many. However, you're not mindless robots. You have every means to see if what any of us are saying matches up with Holy Scripture. And when it doesn't, it shouldn't be followed. You know, in ancient times, however, it was nearly impossible for an average Israelite to be able to fact check what their leader said, whereas in our day, it takes only a little bit of time and effort. So while I will be held accountable before God for what I teach you, you're going to be held accountable before God if you're just too disinterested or lazy to read those same words to be certain I'm not leading you astray. Bottom line, the people of Israel, the children, might wish they could def deflect the, the, the blame for their idolatry towards their leaders, Gomer, their mother, and therefore not suffer the consequences, but God says that's simply not how it's going to be. So now, now that the children and their mother, the people in the leadership of Israel, are being more or less lumped together in their guilt, God says that she ran after her lovers. Now her lovers are the Baals and the pagans of other nations with whom Israel has made peace treaties. And these treaties, nearly to a fault, involved economic benefits to both sides. The treaties were made to increase prosperity. This is expressed by saying that the woman's lovers would provide her with food and water and wool and flax and olive oil and wine. That is, it's the full spectrum of what a husband was to provide for his wife. And converting this thought to God and to Israel, it means that Israel went to the false gods of the pagan worship systems of other nations, hoping to receive fruitfulness in return. And when fruitfulness happened, why, they praised those other gods, and they presented their first fruits offerings to them, instead of honoring the God of their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In cultural terms of that ancient era, this is a rather full definition of the term idolatry. Now, I suspect I could spend the remainder of our time together today overlaying this onto the landscape of our modern Western cultures, but I'm going to try to keep it brief. The principle's basic. We are to seek out Jehovah for our well-being in virtually every area of our existence. We should not seek out those who are opposed to God or offering other gods to bolster this hope for well-being. There are today, as there's been throughout history, nations and substantial people groups that might be best called pariahs. Often in order to obtain some type of increase to our wealth, or perhaps to give us some necessary raw material or maybe some devices that we think we need, we'll make a pact with the devil, so to speak. 
This nearly always involves a dilution of our principles and inevitably will lead to some amount of adoption of, or at least tolerance to, the principles of practice with whomever it is that we make a treaty. We're seeing this play out today before our eyes. And you know, no one's sure how to extract ourselves from it. Because we've become in, so dependent on these pariahs for many things that we desire. And because these other nations provide us with a profitable mar market to sell our things into. Now this doesn't mean that no amount of interacting or trade can occur between a God worshiper and someone who isn't. The issue is the depth of involvement and commitment. What a God worshiper has to acquiesce to or to give up in order for that to happen. There was nothing wrong with the Israelites buying spices and unique goods from traveling merchant caravans that came from faraway places. Because no cultural, religious, or governmental ties were established. Nor was there any need for Israel to have, have been hostile towards those merchants or even to their pagan neighbors. But that's not what Israel did. They connected themselves through treaties and in time intentionally formed a deeper level of relationship with neighboring nations. They co-mingled societies. They encouraged their sons and daughters to marry into families of these pagan neighbors and vice versa. And the Israelites would attend their pagan festivities in order to be good neighbors, to promote peace. Probably some of those pagans would attend some of Israel's festivals in return. You know, far before these past few years in modern times that the cry has arisen to a fever pitch for tolerance and diversity at all costs in the Western world, Israel thought, that tolerance and diversity was their pathway to economic success and to security. Now, because all ancient societies had their own God systems, then those God systems played a large role in the everyday lives of those citizens. If one was going to have good relations between nations, a respect for one another's gods was a requirement. Now, from a human standpoint, that might sound pragmatic, even intelligent, or kind and wise. But from God's standpoint, it's foolish. It's an affront to Him. It's bound to lead to sin and, and worse. Now, today, with the resurgence of Islam in the world on the one hand, and atheist humanism on the other, there has been a rush among the nations and even within the Christian community to find a way not only to peaceably coexist, but also to exploit this vast market of people for economic and for other reasons. I have personal knowledge of large Christian missionary organizations that in order to fulfill that agenda of peaceful coexistence, openly contend that Islam is good, that their holy book, the Koran, should not be seen as less correct or less holy than our own holy book, the Bible. They declare that we are all merely worshiping the same God. Alternatively, our recent national leaders have told us that faith in anything is a good and valid faith, but faith in science is the best faith. Ladies and gentlemen, this is precisely what we're reading about that was happening within Israel in Hosea's day. And Israel was about to lose God's blessing and their nation in consequence of it. Unfortunately, they didn't believe that. For some reason, a widely accepted Christian mantra exists that Jesus changed 
all of God's rules. So we can do the very things that Israel could not. This goes back to what I opened with today. There is a truth that so many believers don't seem to want to hear. Why? You know, many years ago, I was having a talk with my father about a subject I don't honestly remember what it was about. Whatever it was, it must, I must have been pretty seriously off beam because my father did something he rarely, rarely, rarely ever did. He told me I was wrong. And why? I told him I didn't believe him. And he looked at me, and he studied me for a moment, and he said, oh, I think you believe it. You just don't like what it means. Now, even though I'm quite sure I did what I thought best, no doubt with poor results, nonetheless, his words have never left me. I believed what I wanted to believe, because I wanted what I wanted. Verse 8 says that because of how unfaithful Gomer, Israel, has become, Jehovah is going to erect barriers to block her way. That is, since the delinquent wife, Israel, hasn't got the sense to restrain herself, behaving more like a dumb animal that has a tendency to go wander off, God is going to try to fence her in. Or better, God is going to create a kind of a barrier that will result in Israel's race after her lovers not producing what she'd hoped for. Rather, God would see to it that the previous advantages that Israel had been receiving for these illicit relationships would begin to disappear. How? Well, history shows that Assyria would keep gobbling up the many nations around Israel with whom Israel had made these treaties, thus changing how Israel and those nations could relate and do business. Now, Israel's foolish dependence, I, I think addiction is a better term, on those pagan nations, and now Assyria cutting them off from it, led to a rapid decline in Israel's prosperity. But even that wasn't the end of it. Soon it would mean that Assyria would lay their sights on Israel's territory and expel them from their own land. The sins of the adulterous wife would finally find their devastating consequences. Now, verse 9 explains that Israel, despite the warning from Hosea, will nonetheless continue her pursuit of her lovers. These same pagan relationships that up to now had profited her. She will be determined to do so to her own destruction. The idea is that only then will Israel discover that her only hope is in Jehovah and not in some non-existent Baals. But it's too late. It's too late. Disaster is going to overcome Israel as the wheels of her destruction have been set in motion by Assyria. And they aren't about to relent because they're winning. In panic, Israel will say, you know, I'll go and return to my first first husband, because things were better for me then than they are now. This isn't a statement that there's going to be a divorce or a remarriage. The return is an expression of regret more than of repentance. It's a hypothetical statement that captures what the adulterous woman's attitude will probably be because her character is so poor. It's self-serving. Whatever benefit fits her the most, that's what she'll do. If serving Baals, her lovers, gets her the most, she'll choose that. If serving Jehovah, her husband, gets her the most, she'll choose that. 
Right and truth have nothing to do with it. This is a thoroughly ruined woman. Ruined as a result of her adultery, her flirtations with other gods. Why is she behaving as she is? Why does she think she can just step in and step out of God's favor according to her will and whim? Well, verse 10 tells us that. Verse 10 says, For she doesn't know it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil. I who increased her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. I mean, let those words sink in for a second. Israel does what she's doing because of a lack of knowledge. A lack of knowing that it was her husband, Jehovah, who had been providing her with these good things all along. Instead, she took what Jehovah provided and presented thanks to Baal for them. Now, a couple of chapters from now, this same thought of a lack of knowledge will be repeated and expanded when we get to Hosea chapter 4. Verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for a want of knowledge. Because you rejected knowledge, I will also reject you as priest for me. Because you forgot the Torah of your God, I will also forget your children. The more familiar quote we get in that verse is, Because you forgot the law of your God. What law? Well, the only law. The Hebrew is very specific. The law of the Torah. Israel has substituted customs and traditions and doctrines for truth. She has set aside the Torah in favor of man-made rules and regulations and economic treaties. Man-made religious rules and regulations are foolishness. The Torah is knowledge, and Israel no longer has this knowledge. So, she continues to make the poor decisions she's been making for the past century. Now, I'm going to confront you all with a personal question. Have you forgotten God's Torah? I mean, the term forgotten Biblical terms can mean you knew it at one time, but it's left your memory. Or it can mean that you never actually knew it in the first place because you placed little value in it. You think this warning in Hosea is only for the ancient people of Israel? The church for many centuries has said that's the case. In fact, much of the church says it's a sin to learn the Torah. And doing so could even drive you away from Christ. What does Jesus, the one who supposedly said that we should forget the Torah, actually have to say about it? Well, our good fortune is, it's recorded. We don't have to guess. Matthew 5, 17 through 19. Don't think I've come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I've come not to abolish, but to complete. Yes, indeed, I tell you, that until heaven and earth passes away, not so much as a uter or a stroke will pass from the Torah, not until everything that must happen has happened. So, whoever disobeys the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. To not know God's Torah is to reject knowledge. To reject Torah knowledge is to reject truth. And when that happens, the result is catastrophic. Even though the catastrophe might be a long time coming. Verse 11 speaks of the arrival of that catastrophe for Israel. Hosea 2.11 so I will take back my grain at harvest time and my wine in its season. I will snatch away my wool and flax given to cover her naked body. Judgment. Judgment. God has been providing for Israel. Hosea has been providing for Gomer. 
but Israel credited her lovers for it. And I'm going to reiterate something I said just a few minutes ago. Because every nation's God system was part and parcel of their everyday life, then for Israel to credit neighboring nations for their prosperity automatically meant to credit those neighbors' gods for it. All parties would have seen it that way. The day has come that the provision from God ends. He will stop giving Israel good grain and grape harvests. The sheep that provide wool will no longer thrive. The flax for the linen won't grow. Gomer, with her nakedness, will be exposed for her shame with nothing to cover her up. In other words, Israel's confidence in their abundance comes to a halt. The house of cards finally falls. All their bravado as to why they have such abundance is muted. People of the Western world, I'm going to say this bluntly. Whatever abundance we have enjoyed, and it is enormous, is because God has provided it. However, the new gods of science and human intellect are what's being given the credit for it. Don't for a moment think this isn't idolatry or think this is not how God judges it. Science and human intellect are wonderful things, but these too are God's provision, and He is to be praised and glorified for them. I mean, the truly terrifying issue is this. Long before on earth we see the fruits of our idolatry and sin come upon us, it's decided and put into motion in heaven. It's unstoppable. And once a crisis level on earth has been reached and all of man's attempts to fix it ourselves have proved weak, ineffective, and then we finally turn to God and admit our sins, it's too late. This chapter in Hosea is explaining this to us in unflinching terms, but do we have the ears to hear? Verse 12 sort of expounds on verse 11 by linking the the naked body remark with uncovering shame, and the two are essentially synonymous. Gomer's lovers will be witness to her fall into shame and deprivation, and certainly no longer be her lovers. That is, those with whom Israel had such tight relations in the good times, Israel crediting them for the good times, they're going to flee in the bad times, even mocking Israel for her troubles. Jehovah is showing Israel and their region just who's in charge here. It's a very hard lesson that if Israel only had the knowledge of the Torah, they would never have to be suffering. Her former lovers gawk at her new and terrible condition while Jehovah, yeah, he stands at a distance and he lets it happen. He has withdrawn his covenant obligation to feed her, clothe her, protect her, because she's been unfaithful to the covenant agreement while he has been completely faithful. The next verse warrants some extra scrutiny. Verse 13, I will end her happiness, her festivals, Rosh Hodesh and Shabbats and all of her designated times. Here it is in the King James Version. I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all of her solemn feasts. And I'm going to begin by telling you the way this is mostly this is most widely interpreted to mean. Since the conclusion is that God is divorcing Israel, wrong conclusion, then this means Israel's abolishing his covenant with Israel, the covenant of Moses. Therefore, quite naturally, the feast days, 
new moons, Sabbaths, and other festive occasions that are contained as the commands in the covenant of Moses must also be abolished. Because the beginning assumption of all this is biblically incorrect, then the final assumption concerning feasts and Sabbaths is also incorrect. It has to be. It's where you wind up. What this verse is speaking about is this. Israel will no longer be in their own land or able to celebrate these appointed times as listed in the Torah. The reality for Israel at this time was that most Israelites had ceased traveling from the northern kingdom to Jerusalem in Judah in order to go to the temple and worship and sacrifice theirs for the Torah commandments. Rather, King Jeroboam had instituted other places of worship, one of them in Dan, another in Bethel, for his citizens to go to and sacrifice and worship. So for most of the people of the ten tribes, they'd long ago stopped observing the Torah commandments regarding these special holy days in, their, in the ways and the places they were supposed to be observed. Instead, some man-made limitations of these occasions were or not limitate, rather, imitations of these uh, occasions were substituted for what the Torah prescribed. However, since it will dawn on Israel what they've done wrong and why this terrible evil has befallen them due to their exile and oppression by the, all these pagan nations, they now won't be able to repent and go to the temple observing these holy days as they should have been all along. They will not be able to celebrate the biblical feasts and new moons that involve sacrifices. All of these happy and holy occasions, they're going to be removed from their ability to separate them. It's not that they've been abolished. In fact, Judah will continue to celebrate these same appointed times for another 130 years or so after Assyria exiles the Israelites in the north. Now, to be clear, nothing was abolished. It's only that Israel would be barred from being able to participate, mostly due to the vast distances that the places they would be sent to just made it prohibitive. They would be far from Jerusalem. Well, verse 14, God turns to the land. And he says that he will cause the trees and the fields to stop producing because Israel has given credit to the Baals for their former abundance. Instead, the fields and the orchards and the vineyards will go fallow. They'll become overgrown. Only wild animals will eat of what grows there. Verse 15 continues the theme of punishment for their idolatry by saying that Israel offered incense, meaning they offered ritual worship, to the Baals on the feast days of the Baal God systems with Israel fully joining in with their pagan neighbors by bedecking themselves in the jewelry and revelry of these occasions. And they did this because instead of pursuing God, they pursued their lovers, the pagans and their males. Well, you know, if this was the end of the story right here, it would be a fully just ending for Israel. Yet our just God is also a merciful God. And so what we see next, beginning in verse 16, is God revealing His character of loving kindness has said in Hebrew to his wayward people. And that's where we'll pick up next time. Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them. Merchandise with a meaning, products with a purpose. HolyLandMarketplace.com. For more teachings, visit, support, or donate at TorahClass.com. Join with us in worship and enjoy God's Word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.